Well, welcome back to Talking With Tech. My name is Chris Bouguet, and I am here today with Rachel Madel. How are you doing, Rachel? I'm doing so good. I just got back from vacation. I'm in. I'm still in vacation mode. Where did you go? I went to Iceland. What was that like? Oh my gosh, it was cold and rainy, um, but awesome. So many really cool waterfalls there, actually. Iceland is a really interesting country because you go from really lush green landscape to volcanic rock and no vegetation, um, all within you know a ten minute drive. So it's just it's really interesting landscape there. Awesome. Did you happen to get any videos while you were there? I did. I took a lot of videos because when you're presented with an epic waterfall, I feel like photos just don't do the trick. So I, I was definitely taking a lot of videos while I was there. And um, I definitely, I shared some on Facebook too, because I was just like, this is too cool not to share. Yeah. I think I saw one of those like panoramic ones where you like spun around to see the whole, like, look at this thing. This is amazing. Right. Yeah. It was, it was a really cool trip. I was really, um, really excited. It was kind of a last minute decision to go. And I'm just really happy that I, I was able to go and, and check it out. Well, so one of the reasons I asked you about videos is because that's really what we're going to talk about today, right? Is video modeling and using videos in therapy and how kids like videos. And so do you have any experience working with videos? I do actually so much experience. So I, I think that videos are really motivating for kids and I'm always trying to figure out how to incorporate them into my therapy because as we all know, motivation is, is so important when you're working with kids, especially using AAC, we need to find some something that's highly motivating and I feel like kids now they love YouTube and they love YouTube videos so if I can figure out how to utilize something that they love like a YouTube video um, it's a win-win kids are really engaged they're really excited to communicate and the beautiful thing about core words is that we can use so many different core words in so many different situations so I can always figure out some core words to target um, you know but there's definitely some 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 guidelines that I, I use when I'm working with videos with kids um, before we hopped on this recording, we actually were talking about how sometimes using videos is, is problematic for kids because they like specific parts of video. And when you kind of come in and say, oh, well, you know, we're only going to watch this part of the video or we're going to watch the whole thing. and We're not going to rewind to your favorite part, you know, over and over again. Um, sometimes problems arise. So, you know, I, I, I like to think about how can I use things that are motivating, but also if it's going to cause a huge tantrum or a problem, um, you know, maybe we don't use a child's favorite video and, and I can introduce them to something that they might like, a, that's a little bit different and they haven't seen it. Um, I don't know, Chris, have you had any experience with using videos and maybe it not going so well? <laughs> yeah, uh, well, I think I had very similar experiences, right? I mean, we know those students that uh, like to keep rewinding the same video and watching that, but I find that usually that is used during a break time, you know? Um, and so there's these two like camps of videos. One, one video is like you're using it instructionally. And then when you're done with the instructional video, like, like when I say instructionally, what I mean is maybe they're sitting around circle time and there's a video playing in the background and they're all watching the video and singing along to it, or maybe even dancing along to it. And then uh, after we've been sitting and, and dancing and watching those videos and doing our thing during circle time, uh, now the next thing on our, on our checklist is to go take a break. And so you go over to this area where you have a different device and that device is exclusively for watching the video that you want to watch. And, and like you said, uh, rewinding to the part you want to watch or watching the whole thing through or have, exactly, whatever it is, taking a break watching a video. Do you find that too, that there's kind of these two types of videos? Yeah, exactly. And, you know, I think that there's definitely something to be said for having a child on a break able to do what they want, right? You know, kids, especially kids with complex communication needs, they're so used to being told all day long what to do. Um, so I'm just a really big advocate in when we say we're going to give a child a break, like we can't jump in and start like, you know, having communication expectations and all these demands and no, don't do it this way. Um, so I really do think when we give kids a break, we should actually give kids a break. Um, and if that means they want to watch the same, you know, 10 second clip of their favorite YouTube video, like go for it. Um, so I do think, you know, there's two different kind of different kinds of ways to use videos. And I think that you know, give kids that break and let them do whatever they want. Um, you know, but also let's utilize video in a really 
in an instructional way, like how you differentiated that, Chris, um, because it can be so useful. Um, I, it reminds me of um, an online conference, and I can't remember now which one it was, but I presented Intermission with Susan Berkowitz, who we've had on the podcast. She's fantastic. Definitely listen to that episode if you guys haven't. Um, but we presented on using animated shorts um, and how to model uh, on AAC devices with uh, core words. So animated short is just a really fancy name for a video without words, and they're amazing. And Pixar makes them so you can find so many of these videos on YouTube, and they're fantastic because they actually don't have dialogue, uh, and so you really have to look at characters actions and facial expressions and they're they're usually really kind of fast paced so there's lots of different actions and things happening and a perfect opportunity to model core words um, and one of the things that we talked about in that is you know don't be afraid to hit the pause button um, a, a lot of times i think you know we're like oh we're going to show a video and that's all fine and good, but sometimes things happen really quickly and we kind of have to slow down the process. Um, so I, I always use the caveat of don't be afraid to pause, don't be afraid to rewind and rewatch um, because sometimes these, these shorts are really fast paced, but it's a really good uh, tool to utilize communication. I mean, kids in their downtime, they're using YouTube and they're watching videos, so we might as well capitalize on that and teach them how to communicate about it. That you 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 said this earlier. You said you kind of have certain guidelines. So one of them sounds like a or a rule of thumb, if you will, is to don't be afraid to pause, don't be afraid to rewatch. I'll throw one of my own is, which is um, now this won't apply to the uh, animated shorts that you were just talking about, but other YouTube videos would be turn the captions on. The captions should always be on because research shows that that helps people uh, if they're going to be literate. That's going to help them become literate. It helps them uh, put the words associated with the sounds that are being made. So always have the captions on. Um, do you think, Rachel, there's any difference between uh, animated shorts, like you said, or live action shorts, you know, like the, uh, real people uh, participating? Do you think there's any, I mean, I don't know. I'm, I'm, it's not like I have some sort of research bucket here that says, that, yes, that, there's some difference. I'm not, I'm not setting you up. <laughs> I'm just wondering <laughs> curious what you're thinking. No, and you know, this. as soon as you said that, it reminded me of Stacey Landberg, who we just had on uh, talking about screen time. And she's presented at ASHA and I've seen her talk a few times and she's wonderful. And she actually did cite some research that shows that people instead of, you know, animated characters, um, from, for kids at a, a very young age is more beneficial. Um, so, and I forget exactly why, and I forget the research. Um, I'll have to circle back and ask her, but, but yeah, I think it was more, you're more likely to, and that, that imitates what a child's more likely to observe, right? As far as communication interactions, you know, if a baby's sitting in a high chair, they're more likely to watch like mommy and daddy have a conversation. Um, you know, so if we show a video of mommy, a mommy and a daddy having conversation, um, it's more likely to translate than I think animated, at least from a very young age. Um, and then she talks about how, you know, as a child develops, um, their understanding of, you know, I don't know if it's 2D or 3D, I forget exactly what it is, uh, but it, it evolves um, as a child develops language. Hmm. I wonder if there's sort of a continuum, like there's um, uh, animated, and then there's watching real people uh, on screen, and then there's watching real people on screen who you know, you know, like there, there's three levels like that, so that if there's like, oh, that's my mom and dad, that's different than watching a mom and dad, which is a lot different than watching an animated mom and dad. Absolutely. And I think that you bring up a really good point. Let's use familiar characters in these videos, right? And it's so easy now with iPhones and tablets to just take a video. Um, and we know from research how great video modeling is, especially for kids with autism. Um, and I'm always recommending that for, for the, the kids that I work with. I tell parents, you know, if you're doing something cool, like going on vacation or going to Disneyland or whatever you're doing, take as many videos and photos as you can because that's useful information or useful in therapy to create activities out of. What's more meaningful than a child's actual trip to Disneyland, creating a story about it or talking about it? Um, kids are really motivated to see themselves, to see the people that they love and care about and their family and friends. Um, so we can use those things. And it's now with technology, it's so easy 
literally, I was in a session yesterday and the, the kid came in the session, mom was at work, the nanny brought them. And she sends me a text message mid session. That's like, totally forgot to send you these. And she sent me like 10 photos of this little guy on vacation. And we were doing a, a sentence building activity where we were kind of looking at photos and building sentences. And as soon as she sent those in, I was like, totally changing what we're doing. We're going to use these photos because they're really motivating. And it just, I can't tell you how it just changed my session, changed my session because now the kid's super motivated. He's like, how did you get photos of me on vacation last week? Um, so it was just, it's really, it's just a really important reminder that if we can use things that are meaningful and relevant to a child's life, um, that's the best. You know, we um, use a strategy where we work where we, you know, the students that they have kind of low intelligibility, but internally they think of themselves as verbal communicators, right? And they try to uh, communicate verbally and they often are successful because the people around them uh, understand what they're saying. Where they get in trouble is when they don't have context, right? So they'll come in on a Monday and start talking about something and everyone in the environment is like, um, okay, like 90% of the time we understand what he's saying, but he's saying something completely novel, so we don't get it right now. So, yeah, and they just kind of nod and smile and wave, boys, smile and wave, like you just um, pretend you know what, what, this, what the student is saying. So with the advent of um, bring your own technology and kids coming in with their own technology and kids using their own devices, one of the strategies we've been teaching the student is uh, – go and take pictures, take pictures of what you did this, you know, if you went to a family weekend and you're with your cousins and you come back and you're talking about your cousins and that cousins has a, has a name and we don't know your cousin's name. And so now you're trying to tell us your cousin's name and we don't know what it is. If you were all of a sudden to bring up, Hey, bring up your device. And then you learn to bring up your device. Now you're providing context. So your second device can act as a way to provide context. And that's all through taking pictures and videos of your cousin or wherever you're going. Absolutely. I actually work with a little boy with Down syndrome and he's, ex he's the exact kid that you're talking about. Um, you know, as far as profile, he talks so much and now I know him really well. And so when I am listening to him, I can kind of guess, especially if I'm like doing something that's a familiar activity or a game I know he loves, I can guess what he's saying. But if he starts talking about something random and there's no context, I have no idea what he's saying. Um, and so we're working on a similar thing, like going to his device, clarifying, um, you know, and that's why it's so important to, you know, teach kids, especially kids who are really verbal. I always try to teach them by modeling when somebody doesn't understand. So I'll do like a very dramatic, like, huh, with like a really crazy facial expression. So the child starts understanding there was a, there was a breakdown in communication. I don't understand what you're saying. Now this is your cue to go to your device and clarify. Um, you know, because I, I do want to support verbal communicators, especially if they're really motivated. Like this little boy that I'm talking about, he loves talking and he's just, he has so much to say, but unfortunately not a lot, not everybody understands him. Um, you know, so just teaching him those, those kind of nonverbal cues that someone's not understanding my message um, is a really great way to remind a child to go to their device and clarify um, the second time if, if somebody doesn't understand. So we talked a little bit about like families taking videos and, um, and students taking videos of themselves or taking pictures of themselves uh, or, the, or not just themselves, but the environment around them. What about like educators when they're creating instructional materials, they could be using their own students. And that's really what this interview is about uh, that, you're gonna, that you're about to hear. This is a speech therapist and a teacher that have partnered up to make videos of their students actually participating in activities to learn core vocabulary. And then when they made the videos, they're like, well, why don't we just share this out online? And so you, you, they made a whole YouTube channel and they made these kind of really funny, awesome videos for their students. Yeah, I know. I, t I, I, I watched a few of the videos and I think they're so, they're so well done. And it's just, it's really nice how they break them down into, you know, very simple core words. Like one is loud and was it loud and soft? I forget. I think it's, yeah. it's, it's loud and soft. Yeah. And so it's, it's, it's really nice because I'm always kind of flying by the seat of my pants in therapy, it feels like. And, you know, I'll introduce a concept like loud and then I'll think, oh, what, what's, what are some loud things that I can find on YouTube and to demonstrate that concept, but they kind of take the legwork out of it for you. Um, and just from a planning perspective, it's really nice if you're able to say, okay, I'm going to work on loud and soft today. I already have a video in my 
toolbox of what I can pull up to kind of demonstrate these things that I'm trying to teach. Um, and it's just really nice. I found that YouTube is so invaluable in that way. Um, and it, if you guys are part of our Facebook group, please join us because I'm going to post uh, a link to a playlist that I have. Um, I have two playlists that are awesome on YouTube. One is of animated shorts. So there's tons of animated shorts that you can use. You don't have to Google them or find them. I've already found them. And then the other one is social skills, um, which is a really great way to teach um, with video modeling because social skills are so nuanced and we can teach kids all day long about the, the rules of social language and the rules of communication. Uh, but it's really nice to demonstrate you know, how it's done. Um, and so there's a lot of really great social skills clips. Um, so I have a playlist for both of those and I can link to it on our Facebook group. So please join us if you're not uh, already a member. So without further ado, here's Nicole Wingate and Angie Sheets from Indiana. Welcome to Talking With Tech. I am here with Angie Sheets, and then you're there with your partner, Nicole Wingy. Hi, Nicole. How's it going? It is going great. So tell me a little bit about yourselves. Where do you work? What do you do? Well, I'm Nicole Wingy. I'm a speech language pathologist. I work for the Bluffton Harrison Metropolitan School District. Um, I've been an SLP within the schools for, I'm going on my 19th year. I've been at Bluffton um, exclusively this is my sixth year, so. Bluffton is in Indiana, right? Yes. All right, and what about you, Angie? I am Angie Sheets, and I'm an intense interventions teacher at Bluffton Elementary School. And I actually started my student teaching here and never ever thought I would end up being an elementary teacher, but somehow fell in love and just stayed put. So I'm in my 19th year as well, and I serve students grades K through four with a wide variety of needs. I'm also a parent of a child with a disability, so that plays an interesting role in it all also. And I'm luck lucky to be right across the hall from Nicole. So we work well together. Gotcha. So you serve the same students, right? I mean, Nicole, you work in the same classroom as Angie, and Angie, you work in the same classroom as Nicole? Yes, absolutely. Cool. All right. So tell me a little bit about your journey with AAC, because um, just to go back a little bit, where I met you was at the Patents Conference, I think, back in Indiana. And I remember just learning from you all of this, like, intervention and how you've been tackling AAC. So tell me a little bit, what does it look like in your neck of the woods? Okay. I'll go first. So when I came aboard at Bluffton, I asked Angie, I'm like, hey, can I do, like, a push-in language lesson into your classroom? And of course, she was like, sure, come on in. And so I would go into her classroom once a week. And at that time, um, most of our students were verbal, and she was doing more theme-based lessons. And so, you know, obviously, I would get the theme ahead of time from her and, and plan this language lesson and go in. And usually, she was finishing up something, or then I would take over, and she would jump in. And I just felt like... I mean, she's a fabulous teacher, and I thought, oh my goodness, you don't need me to do this because you're already providing this language-enriched environment. So I just kind of felt like, okay, what, what else can we do? And then the population. When you say themes, do you mean like this week is apples, and next week is camping, and next yeah. week is... Okay, yeah, cool. used to do that. <laughs> <laughs> Not anymore. <I> used to. <laughs> So then uh, the population in our classroom began to shift. And so those verbal students were moving on and the students that we were gaining were more nonverbal and they really did not have any, wouldn't say any means, but they had um, limited. just limited means of communication. We just sort of felt like, okay, you know, something's got to change. We can no longer just be serving, servicing these kids the way we were and we have to give them something and we can't just do nothing. Um, and so I first went to, gosh, a conference provided by our Region 8 training, and there was a rep from Prinky Romy there, and that's when I first learned about Lamp Words for Life. And so and I had delved into different AAC apps. Goodness, that's when Solo Code Go was coming out um, and Touch Chat and all of those. But for me, it was like, okay, if I'm going to be recommending something I sure want to be confident in what I'm recommending because this is costing the school money. And so I sort of had a different mindset of 
okay, it's, it's not all about that. It's providing what's best for the student and giving them a means to communicate and access their curriculum. So we first started out by hosting a LAMP training at our school. That was a great jumping, jumping off point. It was a great place to start. Um, by hosting that LAMP training at our school, we were able to have um, several free slots that allowed our parents to participate, as well as my classroom assistants, which was so important to have those assistants trained with this as well. And really learning about the LAMP process, uh, we loved it. First of all, it, great, it gave lots of amazing tips and tricks to help most of our complex users gain access to communication mm -hmm. they, that they hadn't had before. It was also that starting point for us to really dive in and look at, okay, what are some other options? LAMP might be wonderful for some, but it might not be the best option for everyone. You know, how else can we find those pieces that are going to work? And it really just piqued their interest to start exploring more and diving in deeper and checking out what's there. So, Can I ask, how long ago about was this? Four years ago. About four years ago. Okay. Four, ago. Yeah, in some ways, four years is like a long time, but in other ways, it's not long at all, right? Right. <laughs> One really cool piece of it that Nicole started was we meet with our principal annually to set up our professional goals. And so Nicole made it her professional goal to learn more about AAC. And the really cool part about that is that our principal holds us accountable to those goals. And nobody wants to set <laughs> principal. All right. So that was really, um, you know, a sticking point for us to just keep moving forward. If we knew our principal was going to be asking at the end of the year, how are you moving forward with this goal? How can I help support you in meeting this goal? So that was an important professional move. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Let me ask you, the LAMP training that you had, uh, was it from John Halloran or did you have someone else from the Pranky Romich company or was it someone else who's just a LAMP certified trainer? So our first LAMP training was with Christina Grubbs and so she came and we did um, the intro, the two-day LAMP training and then just this last spring we hosted a Moving Forward with LAMP with John Halloran. So that awesome. was absolutely amazing. Oh, yeah. So from all of that, um, Angie and I are both LAMP certified professionals and Bluffton Harrison Elementary School is a LAMP Center for Excellence. Cool. That's so cool. All right. And now, so when I met you at the Patents Conference. Um, <laughs> that seems like forever ago. <laughs> I know, doesn't it? But uh, you guys were kind of showing off some of the implementation tools and strategies that were, you were using. So, um, and I think those, whether you are, have students with LAMP or whether you don't and using other AAC apps, they're sort of universal implementation strategies. Am I thinking of that correctly? Absolutely. So once we learned more about core vocabulary, uh, we just were trying to think about, okay, how can we teach our students core vocabulary in a meaningful and engagement way? And we've been studying a lot about the evidence-based practices, and we've been utilizing uh, video modeling for a lot of shaping of different behaviors, and it was just kind of a no-brainer. Well, let's start using it for vocabulary teaching and a vocabulary tool and modeling in that manner so that our students were able to see these videos using core vocabulary across multiple environments with their peers in different settings, and it just took off from there. So let me guess, so you're thinking, okay, video modeling is a good strategy, and we want to teach core vocabulary, so let's do some YouTube searches or Google searches to find videos on core vocabulary and kids using them, and did you do that? No. <laughs> <laughs> so... Well, let me tell you, I've done it, and it's, it's scant. Do you know what I mean? Like, there's not a lot of videos that teach those specific concepts for students in AAC. Do you know what I'm saying? Right. Uh, and so, you, what did you create? <laughs> <laughs> it actually started because my own kids at that time were the Sesame Street age, and I was watching Sesame Street with the, the word on the street with Murray. So, I was uh -huh. like, let's carry that over. So, we did the core word of the week with uh, our speech peeps. <laughs> <laughs> And so they started off pretty basic, and then we just sort of, we would brainstorm, okay, what are all the ways we can use the word go? What are all the ways we could use the word stop? And then we would just, you know, get together when we had some free time, and we would go video all of those shots that we thought about, and then we would edit it, and we would put, just put it in iMovie. I mean, they can be much more professional. They're not <laughs> professional by any means. Um, and our assistants are critical yeah. in that. They would just go and snap some quick shots, some quick videos wherever, and it's, it's really not a, 
a polished process by any means because we're teachers. We work in the public school, we're busy. So it's gotta be fast and it's gotta be practical. Not only has it been reinforcing for our students, but it's also been reinforcing for us as well and for the rest of our staff because they're now understanding what we're teaching our students. Uh, so, I mean, cause we get the whole staff involved it's general like a cool ed, thing now. General ed students, <laughs> I mean, we'll kind of like walk around and peek in classrooms. Oh, it doesn't look like they're doing something too important. Hey, do you mind? You know, I need five students, you know, to help me shoot a video. And the whole class is raising their hand. Everybody wants to help out. Um, the staff, too. They yes, love to be involved. Staff. They're we, realizing. Yes. We actually, we did a bloopers reel. Um, <laughs> <laughs> for the end of the year school meeting um, two years ago we did a bloopers reel and yeah it's hilarious um, but our students they they love to see themselves in these videos they love to see um, other people that they know in these videos and so it's been very rewarding engaging for them and just um, a motivator for them to use their AAC it's also fantastic for my parents so our parents don't always see our students in the situation that we see them at at school. And so it's great for our, student, our parents to see those models on video as well so they can keep up with us and know, oh, I can be prompting that way at home. Or, oh, if I set up the scenario at home, maybe I could help support the usage as well. Yeah, can you tell me more about what the titles of the videos are or the topics of the videos? We pick a core word of the week. And we lay out our, we, our, our curriculum map and we match up a core word that goes with each week because we're no longer theme-based, we're standard-based. <laughs> <laughs> um, so trying to find those words that are going to be most supportive of the standards that we're mm -hmm. tackling that week. And um, we started out with that first, first 50, 50 core word list. Um, but yeah, we definitely go along with whatever standards that Angie's hitting in her room that week. So tell me more about that, because I'm not sure uh, either I or maybe some of the listeners would understand. What's the difference between theme-based and standards-based? What, what change or growth have you made? So the standards, we all have academic standards. And in Indiana, we have the Indiana Content Connectors. So those are the alternative standards for our more involved students in special education. So we're still held accountable. Those students are still held accountable to achieve those standards. So previously when we were doing theme-based, I was, honestly, as a special ed teacher, I was kind of left out on a limb and follow your gut and do what you think works well and, you know, make sure everybody's happy. <laughs> That's kind of what it felt like. Um, so now having, uh, being responsible with the state standards as well as with the content connectors, it really gives me much more of a drive and to hold my students to higher expectations. So if I'm, I'm holding my students to higher expectations, I most definitely have got to make sure they've got that means of communication mm -hmm. because I, I'm really confident that my students know a lot more than what they were ever able to communicate before. And putting the right tools in place, we're seeing them achieve a lot more than what we ever thought they were capable of. And I want all my old students back to have a do-over. Having a standards-based curriculum is a big shift for me as a professional because my college years were not spent learning, reading, and writing classes and those techniques to implement the standards. So this whole piece has been a very huge learning process for me. But with the AAC in hand, I, I feel like I've got I've, I've got the keys that I need for my students to unlock that knowledge that they have. And with our content connectors, they're broken down into tiers, tier one, tier two, tier three. And that tier one, the basis for those tier one content connectors or alternative standards is communication. For so every single standard. If a student doesn't have communication, they're not going to keep going through the different tiers, the levels makes that communication the most vital part of our, our, our curriculum of every, mm -hmm. every single piece of it. That sounds awesome. That sounds awesome. I mean, it, what a huge change. So let's go back to the videos for a second, because I want to hear more about how you develop those. If I understand it correctly, it's like, okay, core word of the week. And sometimes it's a word of the week. And sometimes it's words of the week. Yeah. You're thinking about right. And yeah. so your videos sometimes feature more than one word because the words are just natural pairs and they go hand in hand with each other. Yes. And then you sit down as a team and you brainstorm out all the different ways you might use those and write like a little script, if you will. I mean, is, is right. it a script? And Oftentimes right. it's really on the fly, though. <laughs> Don't think this takes hours because it really no. doesn't. But we do like we'll sit around and we're like, OK, you know, we got to start doing this. And so we'll just everyone start brainstorming all the ways that we can use that word and then try to get those clips. Another really cool way that um, a couple of our videos developed was we had a second grade teacher who had attended the LAMP training as well, and she had a couple students in her classroom who were LAMP users also. So she took it upon herself to use this video piece as a writing project for her classroom. 
So we gave her the core words that we were targeting and she used it in her classroom and the students then developed the scripts, they edited their scripts, they assigned the tasks, so they had actors and actresses, they had videographers, they had editors there. Um, and so the students composed these videos for their peers. And then they came to my classroom and we had a big premiere, a big premiere of the video and we had popcorn. And um, so it was really cool because our typical peers also saw our students and what an impact that those videos were having as our students were asking to see it again. I want more, show it again, do it again. Um, <laughs> how powerful their work was for the peers. Oh my gosh. So can I just tell you how awesome that is, right? Because like there's this whole movement of project-based learning and kids you doing... Uh, <laughs> do, <yeah. laughs> well, you know, there's this... Uh, where kids do authentic work, you know what I mean? And you're talking about second grade students tying it to something really meaningful. Like when I go to school today, I, I'm going to make something that has an impact on somebody else. And all the way, I'm going to be learning content along the way, um, but I'm going to be learning all the other skills about communication and uh, collaborating and then storyboarding and then watch as my work actually impacts somebody else's life, you know, where so often I think, I don't know, like when I went to school in second grade, I was like, come in in the morning and write your sentence. And then tomorrow you're going to come in and write another sentence. And the only person who's going to read that sentence is the teacher. And it's like, I don't really feel like when I was in second grade or really in school at all, that I was making a difference in the world, you know, but you're teaching these kids right from the beginning. You're part of a community. People need your help. And the work you're going to do is meaningful. And I think that's just such a powerful message for students and for other teachers, you know? I think that was kind of the launching point for some of our um, disability awareness pieces that we've done and, and trying to make that awareness very clear to our students and building that, um, that premise of acceptance for our kiddos. Yeah. So do the kids come up with, oh, well, like I said, you kind of give them the, the topics, the, 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 the word of the week. And then um, either the kids go out and they make the videos or you're making the videos, meaning you're collecting, uh, you're making the actual recording of the video. What do you drop all that stuff? And how do you organize it all? And who says, well, I'll make the, I'm going to edit it together and put some music behind it. Like, how does that all work? Yeah, we totally seriously take turns uh, uh -huh. because a lot of times we are doing the editing over a weekend um, because we started off a new video on a Monday, but it really honestly doesn't take that long. But we drop it into iMovie where we're able to edit and we put different sound effects and we're working on putting closed captioning in on our video. I got to go back and work on that. Um, but really with our team, I mean, we do have a very collaborative team and everybody pitches in and just takes their turn. Our fantastic assistants yeah. and student teachers and interns are a huge help as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So then uh, the video goes up and you put it on YouTube. Well, can you tell me a little bit about that? Why YouTube as opposed to keeping it private behind? Uh, we'll put it on our little server that no one else can see. So yes, our school is very, I would say, tech savvy and so we use Twitter a lot and, and we did look into the legalities of all of this. Uh, we got the go ahead to go ahead and put it public on YouTube and it also allows our families to access those videos so that they can watch and talk to their kids about it at home. And we also want to encourage other people out there and make your own stuff because it's so exciting to see the response that you get from your students and knowing how meaningful it is to them and doing it in your own environment with your own crops and your own classroom materials and the own, their own peers. That's just so purposeful and so driving for them to, to complete the task at hand there. It's really cool. We just love sharing what we've learned because what we've learned has just been step by step. And if we can help anybody else along the journey, I think that's what this whole community is about. Absolutely, right? I, mean, I, I find that, I mean, I don't know if you guys find that as well, that the AAC community is really all about sharing and all about helping each other and all about, you know, creating resources and sharing them. I think something that's uh, an important thing that you said there, Angie, is that the, the implementation of the video is really twofold. One is that there's the, uh, the, the final product. And so, yeah, you can watch this final product. Kids can learn from the final product. But then there's the whole learning experience of creating the product yourself, right? And so uh, there's some sort of magic that happens when the kids see themselves in the video as opposed to some strange other kids that they don't know in the video, right? Would you, would you say that's true? Absolutely. Mm. I think it's that forward planning as well. I mean, they see themselves performing a task that they might not have done before or they might not do regularly. So seeing themselves and envisioning themselves performing that task or, or saying that word or utilizing that tool in that environment is key, I think, to the whole process. 
Yeah. Do you, you also mentioned that the uh, teaching assistants are involved. Would you say, I mean, that is sometimes a, a struggle um, for the speech therapist or the classroom teacher to get the, the teaching assistants to buy into using a device or understand how to use it, model more. And the, do you find that the creation of the videos gets everybody like, okay, th now I understand what we're trying to do, you know? Yes. So what has helped a lot is so last year I would push into Angie's class twice a week and it was all hands on deck. So it was Angie, her assistants, my assistants, anyone who was available. And we pretty much had a one to one adult student ratio. So we're in Angie's class and we're, we're showing the video, but we're also modeling. So we're modeling for those assistants how to use these devices. We have smart boards and typically what we would do is we would play the video through one time because the kids they just want to see it and of course they're like more 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 so then what we would do is we would go back and after each snippet we pause and so you know there's one snippet pause and then we're able to elicit that word from the student um and then you know we're pretty much we're kind of waiting on everyone everyone gets a turn um and a chance to produce that forward on their AAC device or whatever form of AAC they're using and then we go to the next snippet. I think having the students watching it through one um, kind of gets it out of their system and now they're excited and they want to see what's coming next and so they're very eager to use that word for us but then that's also an opportunity for us to teach our instructional assistants how to use um, the AAC as well. I've heard a lot from other classroom teachers as well that it's difficult to get their assistants to buy in and participate also. We've been really fortunate. I mean, our assistants are phenomenal, but part of it is I think we model constantly for them as well. Mm -hmm. And we have a one for all, all for one kind of attitude. I have my freezer stocked with brownies for my assistants anytime they need them. <laughs> and, um, we really are a, a tight knit group. Um, and my assistants as well, they've seen these celebrations with these kiddos. Mm -hmm. They have been there side by side as we're learning the devices too. We model those mistakes. I'm a big word finder fan. Um, so I, just the whole learning process, sharing it every step of the way with our assistants is critical. And letting them know like it's okay to make a mistake. We're learning this with you. No one here is better than anyone else, so this is a team effort. I think valuing their feedback, too, because mm -hmm. oftentimes they're with our students more directly than we are specifically. Um, so valuing what their responses are. My assistants say, hey, can we put this on a slant board? Well, sure we can. Yeah. Hey, can we mount this differently? You betcha we can, because they're seeing those students in different settings than what we are. We had a student transfer in from another school district that was using a different app on an iPad and the instructional assistant that was working with the student actually said he doesn't have enough words <laughs> to access this or he's not able to access that and I, so we were just like floored like oh my goodness this is amazing. I think yeah. it helps too because we've been super open with our journey that we've been on. We're, we started out from knowing basically <laughs> starting point knowing nothing and we've been very open with our assistants and everyone else about the steps we've taken along the way and the progress that we've seen and the steps that we want to take in the future and so i think being open with that and sharing that with our instructional team has been critical all right well speaking of that angie what are the steps you want to take in the future what direction do you want to head what's coming next for for you well, we really are um, diving into those content connectors more, um, still working on core vocabulary, but also adding some of that fringe vocabulary in with that. Um, we have just seen amazing progress with our students academically and also verbally. Um, oh several, several of our students have become um, a lot more verbal. It's been super exciting to see. Have you also seen, you kind of mentioned um, that this is, turned into a whole school approach and right? you've got other classrooms involved you've got other students involved you've got administrative support do you see that continuing to grow even more teachers maybe do you have any teachers that have adopted the um lamp words for life approach as a as a reading exercise you know what i mean that it's just a thing that's up on the board for sight words and stuff I don't think we've gone that far, or at least not that approach, but we do have several teachers who have said, yes, let me incorporate these. Core, are they, they're becoming more aware of what the core vocabulary words are and how they can support those in the classroom. We mm -hmm. have had some really cool breakthroughs in our community, though, overall. Um, one of my assistants, well, most of my assistants actually work for a local Y, and they do a summer adaptive camp for most of our students. 
we got this great relationship that the Y hires my assistants over the summer. Um, and one of my assistants wrote a grant to make sure that there were devices available at our local Y. She was able to get a couple of iPads to put apps on. That's awesome. That's amazing because they're taking what they've learned in the classroom. They're building it out to the wider world. That's amazing. We also did, um, was, when was that? When we did the Chatterbox Challenge. Oh, yeah. During Disability Awareness Month, we did a Chatterbox Challenge at our school. Um, it was only 30 minutes, but 30 minutes counts. So for yep. 30 minutes, our entire elementary school was silent. And our, our principal did our morning announcements with all kinds of alternative communication. She did sign language. She did. This was all pushed out through a video that she had pre-made. Um, we had some low-tech switches. Yeah. We had voice to text. We had um, some lamp words for life pieces. Yeah. yeah. And so all announcements were put out. So we had like our lunch menu and the pledge and any other announcements that our principal had to say were all done mm -hmm. alternative communication pieces. And then for 30 minutes, all of our students were able to access alternative communication, whether it was gesturing or we had sent out some picture boards or we had light boards. Yeah, we had the slapstick bracelet. Toby, yeah. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> it's pretty eye-opening for many of our students and teachers. Yes, that's amazing. So, uh, hi, wow, the, the Chatterbox Challenge, that's Lindsay Car Cargill? Yes, yes. Yeah. And so t tell if the people who haven't heard of it, what exactly is it? I, mean, I see what you did with it, but what is it for people who don't know? I don't know all the details, to be quite honest with you. Um, I really don't. No, we just took it and spun with it. You're a Chatterbox you just challenge. did your own thing, gotcha. <laughs> What a great way to raise awareness, though, for everybody to kind of understand what's what's happening. And how many students would you say in your school are using augmentative communication? More like 20? 20. Yeah. We're a rural school. I mean, we're not. Yeah. There's a cornfield. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I service the middle school and high school as well. So we do have some kiddos in the other levels that are also using AAC. And we're a centralized program. So we have two other systems that send me students if they feel like they do not have support at their home schools for them. Uh, so back to the videos for one last second. How do people access them? Where do people find them? We've been mentioning that they're on YouTube, but how do they find your uh, your channel? So they can go to Wings Works on YouTube. Yeah, why is it called Wings Works? We really don't know. We don't remember. <laughs> we initiative a long time ago. Well, yes, we were part of a Wings team. <laughs> So, like taking flight or flying off no, yeah, soaring, practices or soaring. something like that. I, yeah. It's really nothing. Gotcha. So the Wings Works doesn't really have a tie to what it is. It's not like you're, no. you're school or the Falcons or something like that. No. no. We had no gotcha. idea it would grow to be this. When it was started, we were just looking for a place to house our cheesy videos. So yeah. How many videos do you think you have up there, Bart? Not enough. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. 10, 12. Oh, we have more, more than, than that. that. I don't yeah. know. I would say 20 some, 30, I don't know. I have no idea. We just keep adding them. And then every so often we'll do a review week. And so we'll review four weeks worth of core words at a time. I have QR codes with them too. So the kiddos can just scan and bring up a word if they need to, or if it's working on a specific vocabulary word or specific spelling word that they're worth too. That's awesome. And like you said, parents can watch them at home and you can spread and spread the word that way. That's fantastic. Well, I was so inspired by, by your videos because I kept thinking, how come I can't find any videos on core vocabulary, you know, teaching core vocabulary? And then here you guys came along and it's like, it's not like you have any, uh, what's that old expression? Like we all have 24 hours in a day. Like your teachers and speech therapists, just like every other school district is a teacher and a speech therapist. Do you know what I mean? And we all have these challenges of students with AAC, but you kind of said, well, these, these videos were we know video modeling is a good thing. We, we know the research behind it. Let's actually make it, you know, and you're the, uh, the I mean, there might be others out there, but you're the first ones that I've really encountered that are really, I think, embody the, the fun of it too. Like if you watch the videos, they're not like, you speed up the motion sometimes and sometimes you don't. And it's so cleverly done that it's engaging and enjoyable for people to watch that uh, it's not just for students. Like uh, people can watch it as well. You know, adults can watch it as well. Yeah. And we, we really, we have fun doing it. I mean, it's rewarding for the students, but it's also rewarding for <laughs> us too. I mean, you have to have fun doing your job, right? So. Awesome. Well, we'll definitely drop the link to your channel. Is there anything else that we should share as well? We can send you a link, some other stuff. Great. Well, anything, we will take that and we will drop it in the in the show notes for anyone who wants to and check these out, which I highly encourage everybody to do because they're so much fun. And then even on top of that, 
is just like Angie and Nicole were saying, go out and make your own because there's not enough of these videos out there in the world. And just the experience of making the videos is a huge learning experience for not just the students, but the staff involved. So thank you both, Angie and Nicole. Thanks for coming on the podcast. Thanks for doing the work that you're doing. And thanks for sharing it with the world. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Angie and Nicole, for that great interview. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. Really inspirational. They, they're talking about how they make the videos, and I think that's a big takeaway. Anyone can make these videos. You could do it too. You can do this for your students and then put them out there for the world. And you know, something else this interview reminded me of is it's really a great tool for carryover. So if you, I always recommend if uh, your clients are a willing and able and they sign the right releases, um, you can actually start a private uh, Vimeo or YouTube channel where you need a, it's password protected. So nobody's going to see it except who has the password and the link. Um, but it's a really great way to do updates on progress. So instead of me sending, you know, a five paragraph email about what we're working on, I can send a 30 second video clip um, of, you know, me in action in therapy. And so many people can benefit from watching that. It's like having somebody in my session. Um, so if your your clients are, are willing to, you know, sign the appropriate release forms um, and, and are okay with it, I think it's a really great way to check in on progress and, you know, share it with the team. Yeah. Could people then subscribe to it? Um, I, I believe so. Yes, they could. They could subscribe to, to the individual channels. And you could also, while you're subscribing, you could subscribe to Talking With Tech. Um, if you guys haven't already, please subscribe so you know exactly when uh, we release new podcasts. Um, and please leave a review. Honestly, I just went on there the other day to read some of the reviews that you guys wrote, and they really touched my heart. It just feels so great that everybody's benefiting from the information that we're providing. And people have the nicest things to say. So just thank you so much. And we appreciate all of you guys so much. For Talking With Tech, this is Chris Bouguet with Rachel Madel, and we'll talk to you next week.